So I'm sending out smudge to each of you. Feel free to receive this cleansing smoke. I think we later for a, a time of good connection, learning, and inspiring each other. So I'm thinking it's it's maybe maybe we should begin, um, and if other people join, they can. We have a few minutes of just kind of introduction, so there'll be time for people to be folded in. Um, my name is Andrea Curry. I'm on the core team of the Narrative Project, and I, I want to begin by welcoming you all here. It's so wonderful to see so many of you joining us for this gathering, which is called Land, Water, Ourselves, Each Other. And the issue we're going to explore together this morning on this call is environmental racism. And we're very, very um, fortunate to have with us some amazing storytellers um, who bring stories that are, as, as we believe in our indigenous teachings, are medicine and um, I think we all feel the need for the healing medicine of our stories. And um, so I, I really want to um, thank our guests for joining us and I'm going to introduce them in a moment. Um, I'm just gonna do a check because I, I wanna see if Mary Louise Bernard is on the call. I have a feeling something came up and she hasn't been able to make it. I don't see her. Um, so I'm going to begin by with a song. I'd like to acknowledge that we're on the unceded ancestral territory of the Mi'kmaq people, most of us, not all of us perhaps, but most of us are in Mi'kmaq. And um, as a way of grounding ourselves in that truth and honoring the ancestors of this land, um, I'm going to share the gathering song the Mi'kmaq Gathering Song, Wedjkwi Dajik. And I'll just mention that um, there's an insertion in this version of Wedjkwi Dajik of a chant called the Forest Chant, uh, which I think is um, appropriate for our topic this morning, um, honoring the land and the water. So um, I'll begin with Wedjkwi Dajik. I'll just let you know that a, a sort of brief translation of the Mi'kmaq words um, Basically, the first verse says, my family is gathering. We are happy to be together. The second verse says, my in-laws are here. They know the way. It's a well-worn path. And the third verse um, says, all my relations, all my relatives are here. And we're going to beat the drum all night long. Wedgkwidajik. Quitajik Ningigoma Uda Dead Nikea. Are we only with the fuzzy? Well, that's well to dig away. Which quitajik miscommit Uda Dead Nikea. Enemy teach Don Eldajik, the Kadeji Quitajik no go ma ula det nikea. Get which it a ma dito dito. We hiya yo we. We ha we ha we hiya. We ha we hiya. We hiya yo we. We ha we ha we hiya. We ha we hiya. We hiya. 
exist if we ravage the land. We might as well be cutting off our own right hand, for we and the earth for one under the moon, under the sun. If we lose the oceans that lap the sand, we might as well be cutting off our own right hand, for we and the seas are one under the moon, under the sun, under the moon, under the sun. Which we touch it, me, me, go, ma, uda, dead, me, gay. Ma, we only was the was he held that swell to be the way. Which we touch it, miss, come introduce our guests and uh, and then we're actually going to watch the trailer of the film there's something in the water but first let me share with you who we are so very fortunate to have with us this morning dr ingrid waldron is an associate professor in the faculty of health at dalhousie university where her research teaching and community leadership and advocacy work examine and address the physical and mental health impacts of structural inequalities within healthcare child welfare and the environment in indigenous black immigrant and refugee communities. And over the last eight years, Ingrid has been investigating the socioeconomic, political and health effects of environmental racism in Mi'kmaq and African Nova Scotian communities in particular. Her book, There's Something in the Water, Environmental Racism in Indigenous and Black Communities was the basis for a documentary of the same title that was co-produced by Waldron, actress Ellen Page, Ian Daniel, and Julia Sanderson. Ingrid, thank you so very much for being with us this morning. We also have with us Michelle Francis Denny, who first and foremost prides herself on being a lifelong community member of Picto Landing First Nation here in Mi'kma'ki. She is very passionate about returning Boat Harbor to Oseg, the Mi'kmaq name for that beloved place, and is dedicated to ensuring the cleanup project will help her community heal from the devastating impacts of this toxic legacy. So Michelle is a community liaison coordinator working closely with members of Picto Landing First Nation, the chief and council, representatives from the government of Nova Scotia, private sector consultants and contractors to really keep the lines of communication open between all the stakeholders of the Boat Harbor remediation project. So Michelle, thank you. Walaliak, uh, thank you for being with us. Jelasi. Louise um, Delisle is also with us. And Louise was born and raised in Shelburne, Nova Scotia as the eldest in a family of seven. She's a community activist and founding member of the South End Environmental Injustice Society, SEED, a group that is documenting how a dump that operated in the South End of Shelburne, Nova Scotia has caused devastating health impacts in the African Nova Scotian community that lives there. In 2018, SEED received a human rights award for its work addressing these environmental concerns. And Louise is also the author of Backtalk, Plays of Black Experience. Louise, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us this morning. I'd also like to acknowledge the presence of our beloved elder and teacher, Albert Marshall. Um, Albert, um, 
whenever you're here, I just feel so much better about whatever it is we're going to do. And thank you so much for um, being with us and helping to ground and, and hold this space with us today. Um, so yeah, if, if Olu, if you could show the trailer now, that would be great. And then we'll, uh, we'll move into our, our check-in time. So this is the trailer of the film, There's Something in the Water, which we hope some of you were able to see. Um, but this will give you an idea of it anyway, if you weren't able to see it. Nova Scotia, Canada's ocean playground. In some ways, Nova Scotia is the embodiment of what many view Canada to be, a sweet escape. But when you look beneath the surface, the picture-perfect image begins to crack. Environmental racism is a problem. In Canada, your postal code determines your health. So we know that where you live has bearing on your well-being. Indigenous and Black communities are the ones that tend to be located near hazardous sites. When we got here, they decided they were going to put a dump where everything went. There was body parts, there was food, animals, anything and everything. There were concerns about the impact on the environment. That's what our community smells like. In one view, in one instant, you'll realize why we are here. How environmental racism has affected this community. It's killing us. This lady's husband died of cancer. All the family that lived in this house died of cancer. This man has cancer. Who knows which of our water? The trust has been broken through several governments. Come to us! Step back or you're gonna get arrested. You are poisoning our water. It's just another example of their disregard for our rights. They're doing it and they're not even tricking us. They're just doing it now. Canada is not a nation. It's a corporation. And it's time for it to stop. The bottom line is, is that we're sick of being sick. We hope to heal from all this. Thank you so much, Olu. Um, so as those of you who've been on our narrative project calls before know, there's a bit of a flow that we follow and we begin with a check-in. Um, for a few minutes so that we can make some connections with a couple of other people in the group and um, begin to reflect on our topic. And then we'll come back to the large gathering and uh, we'll have a chance to hear more from our three guests at that time. And then there'll be another period of time where we do some discussions in, in breakout groups. So now is the time when we go into our check-in groups in small groups of three. And um, we have a couple of questions that we'd like you to reflect on. Um, one of the statements in the trailer we just saw said that when you look a little closer, the picture perfect image of Canada begins to crack. Our question, our first question for your check-in groups this morning is, or this afternoon is, um, when did it first start to crack for you? When did this picture perfect image of Canada first start to crack for you? And the second question is, take us to a moment when you really appreciated water. Where were you? What were you feeling, seeing, hearing, touching, smelling? Who was with you? Take us to a moment when you really appreciated water. So Olu will put those questions into the chat box if you need a reminder. And um, once you're in your breakout groups of three, you'll each have five minutes to share um, in response to those questions. And we always say that you can't trade your minutes. And that's because we really believe in the value of everybody's voice and everyone's experience. And we know that each of you has five minutes worth at least. Of, um, of experiences that you can share in, in response to those questions. So um, Olu will put us in the groups now and uh, we'll see you in 15 minutes. Hello everybody.
good to see you all. Are we all back yet, Olu? Yes, we're all back. Yeah. Okay. So um, now we have the great, great privilege of hearing from our guests. And um, yeah, I'm going to ask some questions and, and, uh, and so look forward to, to learning and, and hearing these stories. Um, Ingrid, Andrea, I have a quick I question. Wanted to, yes? Just a, I haven't been a part of this format before. So are the groups, are they supposed to be that small? Yes. Okay. There's three of us. Yes. Okay. That's right. Yes. It's Thank groups you. of three because that's what we've, we've chosen that number so that everyone really has a chance to speak in the short amount of time that we have together. So, got you. Yeah. Louise and I were in there together. So we were like, I don't know what we're supposed to do. <laughs> so we're good now. <laughs> oh, okay. Great. Um, yeah, it's, it, it, for those of you that haven't experienced the process, it might seem a little unfamiliar. So thank you for uh, having faith with us and um, we'll just keep moving through it. So um, yeah, this is the interview portion of the call. And I, I wanted to begin with Ingrid. Ingrid, um, you know, we talked a little bit about questions leading up to today, and we thought it might be good to start with, you know, what are the main things every person should know about environmental racism here in Canada? Obviously, that's a huge question um, here in Nova Scotia in particular. To say Canada would be even a more huge question. Um, so is there a way that you can give us a kind of summary overview of, you know, environmental racism in Nova Scotia? Are you there, Ingrid? So you don't want a definition, you just want some of the key issues that come to mind. I think that's what we were thinking of, yes. Yeah. Uh, well, environmental racism in Canada and Nova Scotia exists. It's a reality. I think, I think the term is problematic for people because they don't understand uh, the subtleties with which in, uh, in environmental racism weaves itself into our society. So when we talk about environmental racism, we're actually talking about uh, environmental policies that are embedded with racial ideologies that suggest that certain communities are worthy of protection and other communities are not. So with environmental racism, racist ideologies get written into environmental policy. Environmental policies that are racist um, then result in the placement of industries in certain communities. So that's a reality. I think when I began, people had issues with the term, um, but what we're really talking about is how policies shape the placement of uh, industries and result in a patterning that overwhelmingly overburdens Indigenous and Black communities. Um, we, sh we should know that environmental racism doesn't happen on its own, right? So when we talk about environmental racism, just like we talk about anything else, that it manifests within a history of racism and colonialism in Canada and particularly in Nova Scotia. So when we talk about environmental racism, it's very difficult um, to, to also not talk about colonialism and uh, inequalities in labor and inequalities in housing, inequalities in employment, these things happen together. And it's much easier than to put an industry in a community that's dealing with those social ills, other social ills, uh, multiple inequalities, because those multiple inequalities destabilize communities, making it much easier for an industry owner to say, that's where I'm gonna put um, that industry, because those are communities that tend not to be able to fight back because they're dealing with so many other competing issues. Um, so I think what I would say about environmental racism in Nova Scotia, that it's really important for, just like in any aspect of racism, for people, including white people, to not immediately get their backs up when they hear racism and to understand that um, we're talking about the subtleties of racism and that it's very important for white people to understand institutional racism and what that looks like. And I. And I feel like when I started the project, it, people just didn't get it. 
It requires an understanding, a critical understanding of the ways in which racism silently, if you like, weaves its way into every social structure. If you as a Canadian don't believe that's happening, then I don't, don't know what to say. Maybe you need to do more reading, um, but it exists. And if we, as Black and Indigenous people say it exists, then it exists. Just like if we say that there's employment discrimination, then it exists, right? Because it's happening to us. Uh, so it's very important for Nova Scotians to be able to listen, right? And hear what we're saying, but also be honest about what they're seeing. Um, it's very strange to me that uh, industries get placed in Indigenous communities across Canada. There are people who would say here in Nova Scotia, but it's about class. Isn't it about class? They're poor. Um, and once again, these are people don't, who don't have a critical understanding of inequality. It's class, yes, but it's also race, yes, and it's also where people are living, right? So for Nova Scotians, you know, in the beginning, I guess, when I started my project, perhaps less so, to deny uh, the existence of environmental racism or any other type of racism it has been really problematic to me because it, it tells me that Canadians continue to, 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 to deny the existence of subtle forms of racism and they're only able to speak to issues of racism that are very overt and direct and not willing to do a little bit more research um, and to understand the subtleties and the institutional nature of the way that racism works in Canada. And we also have to stop looking to the South. We have to stop looking at the United States and pointing fingers, right? Wherever you, where, whenever, wherever you get white people and you get people of color, you will get racism. It reminds me of the, of the, of the um, counselor, I think in Shelburne, or maybe it's the mayor in Shelburne who said there's no racism in Shelburne. Well, that's ridiculous. I mean, there's racism everywhere. So why wouldn't it be in Shelburne? Right, so uh, it's, it's really time for Nova Scotians to stop the denials, right, and start to educate themselves and also to take our word for it, right? So if we say that we are experiencing racism, take our word for it. Um, and that's for all of Canada, but I think it's specifically for environmental racism because it's a hard concept to grasp, which I understand. It's very hard to, to grasp. When I started the project, somebody said, how can the environment be racist? How can water and soil be racist. This is ridiculous, uh, what Dr. Waldron is saying, right? So it's once again, I direct you back to policy, right? Um, policies where racism and racist ideologies and ideologies about who we value and who we don't value in Canadian society, how those ideologies get written into policy and how those policy, including an environmental assessment, then on the ground, leads to disproportionality around the siting of industries. So if, if people can capture, can understand the way it works in that way, um, then I think they will be more open, not just to the realities of environmental racism, but the realities of different types of racism that Black and Indigenous people have been saying for centuries that they've been experiencing. Thank you. Very much, uh, Ingrid. That's really um, a really helpful overview. I want to turn to Louise now. And Louise, you tell a story in the film of being asked by your teacher if you washed that morning because it was impossible to escape the stench of the burning toxic waste at the landfill. And when you told that story, to me, you exposed the double jeopardy of the racist abuse in the placement of the landfill and then an added layer of racism in being blamed for the impact of it. It, it makes me wonder, Louise, you know, how did you come up from that with not only a fighting spirit, but such a loving spirit as well? How did you do that? People around me, the pe my community, um, in, in the black community in Shelburne, I grew up in a community where that old say in a village to raise a child, everybody was everybody's parent. And the many times that I, I would lay on my bedroom floor and listen to groups of people in my parents' house talking about different issues, about racism, about jobs, how they, what they were gonna do, how they were gonna deal with it. And remembering those things and remembering one thing in particular that my father always said, 
was a very simple thing. No matter where you are or what you do, hold your head up and be very proud of who you are. And always remember, if you're doing something, do it for somebody else. And those things, those, those words, those things stayed with me all my life. And that's, that's how I guess I grew up being able to deal with some of um, the racism and the, and the, the name calling and things like that. I remember um, walking to a corner store that used, that was in our community at the time it was run by a, a, a white family and it was in the, on the white, on the street where the white people lived within the black community. And while I was, I was probably 15 and I was always afraid to walk and I never really knew why, but I was always afraid to walk down that street. And one day I walked down that street and that man, there was a man there, an older man, started calling me the N word. What are you doing over here? You don't belong over here, blah, blah, blah. And I was going to the store for my father. So I turned around and went back home. And I told my father and my father went back to the store with me. They never came out when my father came. But he said, you don't, you don't give in to people like that. So the next time I went to the store, I went with my brothers. They went to the store with me. And it stopped eventually, but you know, those are kind of things that that I was taught. You just you just don't give up because you're being treated unfairly. You keep working at what you what you feel is right and what you feel you need to do. Miigwech, Luis, uh, thank you. That's so powerful to hear that story. Um, and I want to turn to you now, Michelle. Um, you know, both, both you and Louise tell stories of shocking amounts of illness and deaths in your communities as a result of environmental racism. And, you know, in my heart, my, it's, my question is like, what, what keeps your communities going? What, what keeps your community of, of, of Pictou Landing First Nation going? Where does your resilience come from? Um, much like to what Louise described, I think we all can link our, our strength and our, our resilience back to some kind of childhood experience. And um, even though each, each one of our stories are different, um, but they've all really defined us who we are today. And growing up in an Indigenous community, plagued already by environmental impacts on top of impacts of racism and residential schools and colonization and violence and substitute or substance abuse and suicide and, and much more. Uh, I don't think we have much of a choice. If we wanted to survive and break these cycles, resilience is a product of all of that in our coping mechanism. And um, it's, it's not to take away from any other um, experiences, but we're all different, but we're the same in some sense. So I hope that makes sense, but um, I just feel like we don't have a choice. Right, yeah, I hear you. Um, there are, I, I'm, I'm in this difficult position today where there's so many questions. I mean, ever since I've seen the film, I, I, this was such, you know, a, a joyous opportunity to have you three to actually, um, you know, be with us and, and have some conversation about this. But I do want, um, I want to bring us to the moment we're in um, and link our discussion today to um, how we're all feeling, the recent brutal murder of George Floyd, the disturbing death of Regis Kaczynski Paquette, has left many of us feeling enraged and discouraged. And many people who are not part of racialized communities want to be allies. So I'm wondering if the three of you could each reflect and, res and share with us, you know, in your experience, what have you found are the characteristics of a trustworthy ally? 
anyone can go first, just whoever wants to respond. Well, an ally has to be somebody who cares about you to start with and care about what you're going through and understand that if it's something hurtful, they can relate in some way to that pain and want to change it. That to me would be the perfect hour. Um, I, we have some very interesting circumstances that have happened around, you know, we've had a lot of things in the media about, you know, not, no pipe rallies and our, our initial protest in June, 2014. And, um, I think what I can take from all this, um, I've had moments of frustration. Um, I do know that fake allies exist. Um, we've suffered the impacts of, of, of having fake allies through all this. Um, but if you consider yourself to be an ally for a cause, there can be no conditions. Right. You can't stand with us to fight a pipeline going into the land or the sea and then criticize us for evoking our treaty rights for moderate livelihood. Um, being a true ally, you know, has no conditions. Um, if you're with us, you're with us. You're, you're educating yourself. You're learning about the whole history. And, and you're, you're, you're sharing that with people. You're helping us build awareness and understandings through everything. So it can't be just something, um, you can't stand with a group of people just for the cause of something you're gonna benefit from. And then when something else comes down the road, criticize the same group of people. Good point. Thank you. Ingrid, did you wanna share some of your insights um, on this? Yeah, I don't have much to add. I would just say that I think the first step for an ally is to, yes, to educate themselves, but also to know um, when, to, when to pull back as well. When to come in and when to pull back. I often say when I, when I teach in my classrooms and white students often say, can you, I'm a white guy, uh, Dr. Waldron, can you tell me how I can be a good ally? And I always say it's like a, it's, it's a bit of a dance. You know how to pull, come in, you need to know how to come pull out as well, right? So I think with white people, there's always a time maybe sometimes because they're excited to uh, take over. Um, and that's also part of whiteness, you know, this desire to take over. But in many cases, it's just because they really want to help and they're very excited and they want to help. But you need to know as an ally when to remove yourself as well. Um, for me, it means that the community need to always be, be leading and as an ally, maybe where you come in is you provide resources and supports, but you shouldn't be leading. Um, so allow these, you should recognize that these communities know what they need, right? And sometimes they don't have the resources um, to get what they need because these are communities that are racially marginalized, that have less connection to the political system and economic resources. So I think for allies, it's about knowing where to come in, where to leave, um, how to support, but to never lead. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm hearing that. Like just Andrea. Yes, Andrew. Andrea, can you hear me? Uh, I can. I, 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 I'm, con I'm constantly being going on, on and off. I don't know what the problem is, and, but I'm afraid sooner than later, the thing is going to go off completely. And if I may, while I if you can give me the opportunity, I'd like to weigh in onto this discussion. Of course, Albert. Before I'm before I come before I completely mean blacked out. Now, um, you see, the thing that the thing that I the thing that we don't understand, we can clearly define what environmental racism is. We can, we can clearly define and identify whenever there is uh, racism by and large. We only make up less than 2% of the Canadian population. But yet, uh, 
the majority of the, and I'm not talking about the good allies that we have, that we have gained. And I'm sure they will understand. But what, what we don't understand though is that since you have, you can clearly define what environmental racism is, I think we might have lost him. Maybe he'll come back. Oh no. Well, hopefully Albert will return to the call and we can give him an opportunity to complete um, the sharing the what he wanted to say. So that's really unfortunate. This is the reality of uh, internet in rural areas. But can I finish? There you are. Sorry, I thought you were gone. We do finish. No, okay. You disappeared from my screen. Sorry. Miss Gay. But anyway, okay. what, I want, what I want to conclude was the general public has clearly defined those problems. But the question still remains. Why is there so many people are refusing to be are using are refusing to be using are, are refusing to acknowledge it, and why are they so continue to be silent about it and inactive? That's one thing I cannot understand. Now, here we are. We should have a common objective, and that common objective is we are we are now at at, at the point in which we could be fighting for our for our very lives because of the state of our current environment environmental degradation that we that has been caused to us. But yet there is this sense of some kind, some form of a superiority over the Caucasian. And I don't understand, I don't understand. I really can't I'm trying to understand with my great grade six education and background, I'm trying to understand it. Why what is it that that I am so different? Just because of a, just because of my dark skin, why am I so different? Why am I being segregated? Why, uh, why, why do I, why have I been on this social isolation for the last 200, 300 years? Now, if are we just talking about these things? Are you there, Albert? Gizigook, Albert? I think the spirit are telling me to shut up, so I'm going to shut up because I keep going off, off. So I, I, I think I'm going to go off because I can't. I can't understand. I can't hear one thing. I don't hear anything, and I don't know what uh, I don't know what the problem is. I think the problem is that it has to be an overload, but that has never happened before. You know, every 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 minute or so, everything goes off the screen, and it takes a while again before it comes back. So anyway, I'm going to sign off because uh, this is too aggravating. Okay. And I hope. You, and I hope. And I hope you will keep me abreast of what's happening. Of course we will. And Wolaliek meet up. Wolaliek for sharing that. I think we heard the challenge in your question and we will uh, we'll continue to think about that. So okay, thank you. Wolaliek Albert. Namotis Albert. All right. We love you, Albert. Thank you. Okay. So um, that that was a gift and that was also difficult for Albert, but I'm glad he was able to speak with us before he had to leave. Um, and now, you know, I have so many more questions and I'm, I know all of you do too, but I think we have been given lots to work with so far. This is not going to be the sum total of our engagement with this issue. So let's work with what we've heard from our guests and go into our breakout groups now. And we do have um, a couple of guiding questions that Olu will put in the chat box for you. Um, looking at the time, I would say we have probably 
seven minutes each um, in the groups, approximately 20 minutes in these small groups this time. Again, it, it will be groups of three. And um, again, we're we are moving from the, the words of our guests as spoken today, as spoken in the film. And there are two questions for these breakouts. One of, the, one of the statements made in the film is, you can't heal in the same environment that made you sick. I'm not sure, I think it might have been Louise, I'm thinking, said that, but one of, that was stated in the film. So the question for your breakout group is, take us to a moment that has given you hope that we can actually create the environment in which we can heal. Take us to a moment that has given you hope that we can actually create the environment in which we can heal. And Michelle says in the film, we just want to reconnect with the land. So the second question is, take us to a moment when you experienced a powerful connection to the land. What was it that was so powerful about that for you? What did you see, hear, touch, smell, and feel? So those are your two questions. Um, they're in the chat box if you need that for reference. And we'll see you in about 20 minutes. I have this kind of wow feeling. I hope that each of you have had the rich conversations that, uh, that we've had. And um, I'm just feeling really honored um, by the good company we're keeping this morning. Or I keep saying this morning. I know it's afternoon. Um, wishful thinking, maybe. But so what we'd like to do at this point, what we, what we usually do at the end of our calls, is we invite everybody to share any insights or things that resonated with you from anything that you heard today on the call um, from our speakers, our guests, from, from your uh, small group, smaller group reflections and to type that into the chat box. We call this the harvest and, um, and we do record this and it will be sent out to all the participants afterwards um, as we're really trying to hear more of these stories, more of the stories we need we need to hear more of, we need the medicine and, and to strengthen those stories and start to weave them together. So um, now is the time to, uh, to share your, your reflections in the chat box. And as you do that, I will, um, I'll read a few of them aloud. Resilience is a product of racism. An ally needs to care about you first and can relate to your pain. Can be no conditions to be a true ally. Know when to pull back, it's a dance. The opportunity to share stories and reflect on is powerful. True allies have no conditions. If we're not clear how to be an ally in a particular space, we can ask. The act of teaching can create space in ourselves for learning and opening ourselves to better understanding. An ally knows when to come in and when to step out. What an amazing opportunity to share ideas and insights. Breathing and being and feeling what it is now to embrace silence. Such a gift to hear about the characteristics of a trustworthy ally. The healing power of nature can depend on relationships with each other because it's something we share. And from Albert, why do people continue to be silent and inactive? Why am I so different? The resilience also resonated for me. The idea that this emerges in childhood made me think again, as I often do, about the importance of supporting resilience in all our children. This resonates with me, I'm sick of being sick. All communities and people are worthy of protection. Having experienced the social isolation more vividly over the past few months, Albert's statement about socialization, social isolation over hundreds of years or tears is painful for me.
Ingrid's comment was very powerful to me. Allies should support, not lead. We must be humble and learn together. The environment that makes us sick is not just a place, not the place we love and where our people are, but the toxins and in industry and the policy and prejudice that makes them possible. Nature is essential to our survival, physical, mental, emotional, spiritual. How did you grow up so loving? Father said, hold your head and be proud of who you are. If you do something, do it for someone else. An invitation, an introduction, a meeting can be the first step to caring, caring as an ally. And a huge thank you to my breakout partners for their courage in being so honest and in sharing. This act gives me hope. If you're doing something, do it for someone else. There's so many beautiful, rich insights here. And I thank you all for, for working with this process, with its challenges. Um, you know, technology is forcing us to be creative and we're doing our best. Um, so I'm always amazed at how engaged and connected we can feel um, when we gather this way. So we have a couple of things to do in our last five minutes. Um, Mary Louise Bernard is with us now, and I would like to have Mary offer the water song as our closing. Okay. But first, I believe, first, Mary, I, I, if you hang on one second. Okay. You guys hear me I now? I believe that Olu uh, wants, yep. So just, I'll give you the cue in one second, um, Mary, because I'd like your song to be the last thing that we hear before okay. we, uh, we say goodbye. You know that uh, I just know that that's going to be a beautiful vibe and a beautiful feeling to end our, our gathering on. So Olu has something he wants to share. And Susan, I don't know if you want to say a couple of words about um, any further gatherings. So maybe to Olu first and then Susan and then to you, Mary. Okay. Thank you, Andrea. So to continue the conversation from this session and share more reflections, we would be sending an invitation via email to everyone on this call to join the Narratives Project Group on Wayside. So Wayside is an online learning platform. It is a place to connect and recharge, collaborate, and discover new possibilities for achieving positive social change. So just to give a short, quick, brief history on Wayside, Michael Chenda was the founder and visionary of Wayside. He also founded ALIA. Um, some of us might know about him. Michael passed away in July 2019, and the Wayside Board turned to inspiring communities to help carry on Michael's vision for Wayside. So we are honored to be able to help carry his legacy. Wayside is still a work in progress for us, and for now, we would be able to have conversations in groups on different topics there. And over the coming months, we would add resources, a blog, and online courses to embark on a learning journey together. So we'll be sending out this invitation to everyone to continue the conversation from today. And we would love your feedback on the experience of joining conversations on Wayside as we soft launch this platform. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Lu. Susan? Um, is Tara here still? She's hosting next week. So I don't know if Tara's here. She wants to just say a word. Yeah, I'm still here. Thanks, Susan. Okay. Um, thank you to Andrea and your guests. Um, it's been quite, quite, quite amazing. Um, just in keeping with this has, uh, session has been talking about connecting to the land and the water and whatnot. And so our next week's session will be connecting to one another, empowering one another. Um, how can we do that to move forward? So one of my guests, I have three, but one of the guests is Dr. Say, who will be doing a little bit of help us do some online Qigong. <laughs> um, we can do some of that throughout the call and just, yeah, reflecting on how we can better connect with ourselves and one another. Miigwech, thank you. Laliak. I think we're ready for you, Mary. So okay. I'm just gonna thank everybody. This, this will be our leaving, our going out and um, Everybody be well and hope to see you next week or the next time our paths cross. Over to you, Mary. Okay. Um, I'll try and say a little bit of this song to you. I made, um, created this song a few years back when I started my ceremonies 
in honoring the waters of the land. And it translates to someone gizalolek, water we love you, that comes from the tree, the maple tree, I'm thinking about the sap in the beginning of spring, that is considered as Mother Earth's milk. I think the water comes from the ocean that is to us the pulse of our mother that beats for us and creates life. I drum for the fresh water comes from the ground that we need to survive. And of course, the rainwater that comes from the sky that nurtures all of us. And when I'll be doing ceremony tomorrow, I've been doing Grandmother Moon's ceremony for several years now. And it's because of my love for the land and for the water. And I'll sing this song to you. And, and I hope to have my Grandmother Moon ceremony broadcast on Facebook or somewhere next, tomorrow evening. Someone gives a We love. 
love you with all your and thank you for inviting me andrea well ali et meet up um namultas nen see you later everybody be well Bye.